family, and welcome to another episode of the One Word Podcast. I am Pastor Iron Petrie, and I'm so thankful that you've chosen to join me today on this beautiful Friday. It is indeed a blessing to be alive and well. Friday is always a good day for most of us, especially if it's payday. <laughs> for some for some of you and for many of you, but I just want to welcome you to the podcast on today. And listen, I, I don't want to go through any preliminaries or belabor the time. I really want to jump right into what I feel like the Spirit of God has burdened my heart to deliver to you today. And I'm so thankful that you're here and you've joined us. Uh, if you would, I would say you want to share this with family and friends uh, that you believe could stand to be encouraged by the Word of God as we jump into something today that I think is very, very important. So without any further ado, uh, this week I was in um, I was in prayer and uh, just spending time with the Lord and, uh, you know, just really thinking about all that God is doing, first of all, in my own life and uh, in my own family, but also uh, thinking about... Um, so much of of what is going on in the world and and how people are living and what's going on and so i'm just very thankful for first of all his grace first of all i'm just very thankful for his grace and mercy so i believe that what you're going to hear here today is really going to help you during these troubled times and these these issues that we're kind of navigating through as we find ourselves in what the bible calls the last days and when you read the scriptures and you know what the Bible says about these times, we know that uh, these times are full of peril, they're full of deception, they're full of uh, tragedy, they're full of all kinds of massive events. When you read uh, Matthew 24, when you hear wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, all of these things are massive events. A lot of times when we read of these things, we don't stop to think about the fact that when we're watching our news today and we hear of these massive events going on where lots of people are injured or hurt or some huge cataclysmic storm or something, we're talking about things on a mass scale. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell us, that in our days, you're going to see an acceleration and an increase of things that will start to happen on a massive scale. I believe for the church that believes and the church that stands on God's word, we're going to see a move of God on a massive scale like we've never seen before. I, I really do believe that, and it's going to be very powerful. But I was just burdened in my heart as a pastor because I see a lot of people, I talk to a lot of people. Um, just in your calling as a pastor, you interface with all kinds of people all the time in different situations in their life where they're asking questions or they're needing help or, or they're trying to um, know what to do in a given situation and what have you. And the Spirit of God just really began to minister to my heart a couple of things to share with you today that I pray will bring clarity to you and give you insight into how you ought to navigate these times for your life. Because how many of you know the most important place to be, the safest place to be, uh, the most provisional place to be is in the will of God. It's not, um, it's not trying to be popular or famous or rich or this, that, or the other. All those little secondary pursuits that the flesh kind of has, those things are really not important today. Those things are really not important ever, really. But given our times and what is uh, upon us, they take on even less importance. What is most important for every person under the sound of my voice is to locate God's plan for your life and to find yourself in the will of God, following him. And he said it's not hard. It's not hard to do so. So I even went old school today. <laughs> I wrote things down on, on a post-it note. <laughs> now, you know, now, you know, that's, that's different. But sometimes when inspiration hits you, you just grab whatever's close to you. Uh, and you just start writing. You just start putting down things that the Spirit of God gives you to, to share. Proverbs 20 and 27 gives us something that we have to take to heart. Proverbs 20 and 27. Write that scripture down. Commit it to memory in your time. Commit it to uh, a time of meditation and study when you get the time. But it tells us that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. The spirit of of man is the candle of the Lord. Now, what does that tell you? That tells me that God's going to illuminate me. 
He is going to enlighten me. He is going to direct me through my spirit. God is not a mind. God is not an emotion. God is not a, a body. So my feelings, my flesh, my, my desires, and all of the things that I have, my ambitions in my mind, the way I think, and intellect. Intellect is important. doesn't mean we have to check our brain in at the door of the kingdom, but it does mean that the mind comes second to the spirit. That is where God leads. That is where God guides. That is where God speaks. And consequently, that is where God provides. So whenever God is providing direction for you, providing an opportunity for you, providing an open door, you're going to know it by your spirit because that is the candle of the Lord. That is the place where the Lord illuminates you. You could say your conscience even. That's the place where you apprehend the will of God, not just in whether you should sin or not or when you do something wrong, but your conscience is also where you apprehend the will of God, where his plan and purpose for you is concerned as well, right? It, it's your true north. It's your compass. It's what tells you, okay, that's God, and it tells you, oh, no, that's not, <laughs> right? And so the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, and I see a lot of people living their life out of their thoughts, out of their feelings and emotions, out of their physical, their flesh and the desires of the body. And people are making decisions and choices off of pressure externally from others. If you do not learn the importance of quieting all the other inputs, you hear me? Like, like inputs into a camera, into a computer, inputs, things that feed into. If you don't learn how to quiet all the other inputs into your life, and prioritize the voice of God in your spirit, we will not apprehend the plan and purpose of God. And it becomes even more compound and difficult and complex and confusing sometimes because just because you're disobedient to God's plan for your life doesn't mean your life is going to immediately go off the rails. And see, and this is one of the things that confuses us. You can be out of God's plan for your life and be doing materially mm, from a carnal, external, observational perspective, good. Oh, you can be doing well. You can be like the Apostle Paul who's persecuting Christians, who's having them thrown in prison, who is prospering above all his peers in his whole nation. That this man was preeminent, he had place, he had rank, but we know he wasn't in the will of God for his life because he tells us that the father from the foundation of the world, from his mother's womb, he said in Galatians chapter 1, the Lord intended for him to do what he called him to do as an apostle. Right? So he was set aside from his mother's womb, but when we find Paul, we do not see him anywhere close <laughs> to anything God, God has set aside for him uh, from his mother's womb. We see him doing something that is opposite of God's plan for his life, but he was doing good at it. And he prospered at it, and he was highly educated, and he had passed through all of the successive filters educationally and religiously, and so he was the man. He was somebody. And so not doing God's plan doesn't mean people won't make advancement. And see, this is where it gets tricky because people think, well, if I don't do the will of God, well, I'll, I'll, let me back up. People many times use as a litmus test for whether or not something is God's will, uh, whether it blows up or not whether things are going good or not. And if things are going good, it was God. Even if <laughs> you, can't really, you can't really find, number one, the peace within that this is God, because you're always going to be checked in the heart. Like I say, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. So even if things are going good, if you check the spirit, your heart will not be pleased. You just won't, you won't be at home in the good. You won't be at home in, in something that looks like, man, this is a nice setup. Uh, things are going great. Things are looking well. Things seem to be looking up in my career. But why am I so disquieted within? Why does it seem like, man? You know, I, I was just watching a, um, and I don't know the gentleman very well, and I, I don't know his work or his artistry very much, but I think he was a country, uh, a Western, a country music singer. And um, I forget his name, but he recently just made a public announcement to step out of 
doing country music anymore, and he has a very, very prosperous career, has very, very popular songs, and uh, he's going into ministry. And he says it's something that he's just carried around for the longest, and he, he just could never reconcile within, you know, uh, doing what he was doing and this call to ministry that, that he just kept, you know, just kept bubbling up within his heart. And so he finally surrendered. And so people were questioning him about, oh, you're going to step away from that large platform you have as a country singer. Why don't you just use that platform to tell them about Jesus in your concerts? Or why don't you just do... And everybody's coming up with, once again, all of these negotiations in the mind as to what a man should do with his life, <laughs> you know. But on the inside of him, the candle of the Lord for him is saying, no, this is what I got to do. Well, can I tell you, that man, as he is following the Spirit of God, oh, his life is about to take on such purpose and power and meaning like he's never known before. And not only that, it's going to be a protection. Because when, when you follow the plan of God, you enter the protection of God. When you follow the purpose of God, you enter the protection of God. So many people want to claim protection without submitting to purpose. Well, you got to do what he tells you to do, and you have to learn how to pay attention to your heart. Are you in a relationship right now that you know in here? Now, it's not about what they look like. It's not about what it feels like. It's not about, it's not about having somebody so I don't feel alone. What is your spirit man saying? What's being illuminated to you within? That's the candle of the Lord. What is he saying to you? I can't tell you the number of people who ignore that candle to their own detriment in all walks of life. They'll say, well, it just didn't seem like that, and, and I know I shouldn't do it. I mean, you, you, you talk to people sometimes, even if you're surrounded by godly counsel, and godly counsel is trying to tell you, mm, that doesn't seem like that doesn't seem like God. You might want to rethink that. You might want to that doesn't line up with the Word. It doesn't line up with the Bible. It doesn't line up with, with, with God's character. You might not need to do that. Well, I mean, I just, I mean, I just feel like it's, it's, it's what I want to do right now. It's the thing for me at the moment. So now all of a sudden we're, we're considering what is placating and satisfying to self at the moment over what is being illuminated in the Spirit. So the person goes on, makes a decision, and then later on down the road, things blow up and things happen. It takes a while. It doesn't just blow up right away. But they walk on, and they walk into something, and then they're like, oh, man. And then there's too much pride to repent. There's too much pride to come back and say, I was wrong. And so the person persists even greater when if they would have just stopped for a moment, quieted their ambition, quieted their flesh, quieted all of the inputs coming in from frustration and fear and worry and anxiety and I'm fed up with this and never make a decision out of anxiety or frustration, by the way. But if you quiet all those inputs in your life, right, and get down to what is actually going on in here. And I, and I, in saying this, it sounds simple, but I understand that sometimes people, sometimes we have entertained so much, we have done so many things that sometimes our innermost counsel even seems a little corrupt. It seems like there's static on the line, if you would. You can't really pick up the illumination of the Spirit within your heart. You can't even really get it. It's the candle of the Lord, but you, you can't really pick it up. And that's where fasting is important. That's where setting aside time. If you're not in a situation where you have to make a decision like right away, well, you need to set aside some time. Take three days and don't do anything. Pray. Get before God. Open his word and just quiet the soul till you can get to the candle. And you quiet all, all of that noise until you can get to that candle, until you can get to what God is illuminating on the inside of your heart. And I'm telling you, it simplifies life and it makes things easy. Number uh, two point I want to bring out here. The Holy Spirit brought this to my attention Listen for God's plan. Don't chase it. Don't chase it. So many people chasing after things. So many people pursuing things. Let your pursuit come from what you've heard. Let your pursuit come from what you've heard. You remember when David 
uh, came back. He, he came from the battle of, I think it was Ziklag, or I forget the, the particular battle he came back from, and all of his army, and they came back to the camp, and I mean, the Philistines had come, and they had destroyed everything and took his wives, and they had taken children, they had destroyed property, and David was in a fix. And needless to say, David was quite upset. And I think this is 1 Samuel 30, if I'm not mistaken. You can check that. If it's not, you can, you can of course, look it up. And it, but I think it is in, in 1 Samuel. But um, David comes back, and David goes and inquires of the Lord. He requests an ephod. He requests time to get away to go pursue in God first. And he says, Lord, shall I pursue? And God tells him, rise up and pursue. So David rises up and pursues, and he recovers all. Now, why was David successful? Because he pursued God first before he pursued a result. He pursued God before pursuing a result. And a lot of people pursue results. They're after the money, uh, the bag. They're after uh, the big ministry. They're after the, the growing of the business. They're after a spouse. They're after... They're chasing results in life. They're after likes and loves and emojis and following and so, so many different things. And so they're after things instead of, first of all, pursuing God. So how do you pursue God? You pursue God with the ears. You listen. You hear. You open up your heart to hear. You set time aside before God and say, I'm going to listen first. Before I go after anything in my life, before I chase anything, before I rise up and make a decision with my money, before I make a decision on a relationship, before I make a decision to start an endeavor, a career, a business, or, or step out into something, I'm going to pursue God first. I'm going to consult him. And if this is okay with him and I get that witness within my spirit, the peace of God in here, then that's when I rise up and I pursue. Because when I rise up and pursue after I've pursued him and he's endorsed uh, what I'm going after, oh, I'm going to have success. I'm going to pursue, I'm going to overtake, I'm going to recover or I'm going to build, I'm going to succeed, I'm going to advance, things are going to go well. Now, it doesn't mean I won't have opposition from the enemy because the devil's going to come after every purpose of God. He's going to resist you. But there's a difference between satanic resistance and the absence of grace. <laughs> and a lot of times we don't know that difference. And there is an absence of grace when we try to pursue something that God does not endorse. And that's a totally different thing. And you don't want that. So you want to sit back and you want to hear. I want to hear. Before, before I do anything, I want to hear. I'm not going to sit up here and let the culture put me in this anxiety-written state of thinking that I got to be this by 35, I've got to have that by this time, I've gotta, I need to be doing this, and see all of this anxiety and all of this comparison because you're looking out at other people and you're comparing where they are to where you are and your age to their age and what stage they're in to your stage, and you're doing all of these things, and none of this is coming from the Spirit. None of this is coming from where the candle is. It's coming from out here. So you're making your decisions based upon external information. That's not how God speaks. He doesn't speak to the mind. He doesn't speak to the emotions. He doesn't speak to the body. He doesn't speak concerning what's going to fit you externally. No, he speaks to you in your heart. So you have to listen, man. You have to listen. And then when you hear, <laughs> this, may, this is deep, okay? When you hear him, do what you hear. Do what you hear. Many of us are in a category where we haven't heard him yet. But there is a whole lot of people in the category of having heard him, but you don't follow through. You've heard it, <laughs> but you're not doing it. <laughs> you're not doing anything with what you've heard. You, you've, you've heard him clearly. You know it's from your spirit. You know it's in your heart, but you won't follow. Follow through on what the Lord is telling you. Do you know how many times for many of us, because this is the thing we have to understand, it is God's job, God's obligation and promise to us. You say God's obligated? Yeah, we didn't obligate him. He obligated himself. We can't obligate God, but he obligated himself out of his love for us by giving us a promise. 
right? That's what a promise really is. It's an obligation. It's, it's, making, it's putting yourself on the line for something. But God has promised to us and obligated himself to us to show us his will. He wouldn't ask you to live his will and he not show it to you. So only he can do that, right? And so God has already obligated himself to reveal his will to us. So right now in your life, right now, the Father either has or is in the process of revealing to you his plan for your life. He is not delinquent. He is not negligent concerning his obligation. He, he either has or he is actively involved right now in trying to reveal to you his plan for your life. I want you to take comfort in that child of God. Take comfort in knowing right now, even in the midst of confusion, even in the midst of fear, even in the midst of whatever you may be dealing with in your life, the Father is actively trying to show you his plan. And what we have to do is be still and know it. We have to hear it. And then when we hear it, we have to follow through on it. You know, I, I, I carry it, and I, and I say this all the time and testify about it for myself. I carried for a long time this <laughs> impression in my heart that I was to pastor. I didn't want to pastor. I know a lot of people who want to pastor. They, they, see some, they see a particular result. Remember, I say we chase results. So if we can formulate through the imagination and end result, we'll go after that. And sometimes that can be God, and sometimes it's just human ambition. We're formulating imaginations from ambition, and they're not implanted by the Spirit of God. They're just ambitious, right? And so some people chase after, ah, that wasn't me. I, I, I did not want to pastor. I did not want to be a pastor. didn't want to be over a ministry and lead it. I could have stayed in the background doing what the Lord was telling me to do, ministering the gospel as he opened doors for me, doing what I was doing and, and doing everything behind the scenes, I could have did that forever. Just my natural disposition, right? But on the inside of me was this candle. Candle came on. <laughs> and the Lord illuminated to me, I want you to pastor. Feed my sheep. I want you to shepherd and feed my flock. And I was like, Lord, Lord, Lord. And I, and I, and I sat on it. And I sat with it and I made sure, because I would rather be slow than to step out ahead of God anyway, it's actually better. You really want to be on time, but it would be better to, to take things slow than to try to jump out and do things hastily. Because when you hastily do things, you, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to do some crazy stuff. <laughs> and you might do some stuff that you can't undo. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm sitting with this, meditating in it talking to the Lord, making sure this is true, making sure this is right. And I'm like, Lord, my goodness. Okay. And so I say, okay, I say yes to it. And the next thing I do is I take it to my brother. I take it someplace I feel like I can trust I'm going to get straight, wise, biblical counsel. And I know that he's connected and we have covering over our ministry to where I know if there is consensus of the spiritual people in my life, I'm hearing. I'm hearing accurately. So I did all of those things, and make a long story short, of course, it was a yes, 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 and amen. So I step into pastoring, and I start doing what the Lord tells me to do. I start making changes and making the steps and taking the steps the Lord tells me. It wasn't enough for me to acknowledge a call. I got to then do it. It's not enough to acknowledge you heard you must then follow through. And so many people are where they are right now because they haven't followed through. They've had so many different opportunities where God has shown them what they're supposed to be doing. And it just, it's, it, it just passes through the heart. And it just keeps passing through the heart. And God is faithful to keep it passing through the heart. But they will never pick it up because of either ego, if not ego, fear and worry, um, intimidation. If it's not that, it's it's just false humility and all these thoughts about what people are going to think and all of these different things that go on in people's heads, right? We all, we all got a flesh. And so we disqualify ourselves and we let God's plan just pass us right by. And then he's faithful, though. He'll make it pass by again in your heart, that is to say. And then it'll come up again. 
and you'll keep going on. Well, now I'm going to go do this. Well, I'm going to go do that. And, you, and you'll try to busy your life with a lot of activity over top of what God keeps passing in front of you. And you just, you just, you think it's got to be deeper than that. It's got to be more than that. I'm supposed to be over here. I'm supposed to be doing that over there. And you got all these thoughts in your head about what you're, you're supposed to be doing. But the plan of the Lord just keeps floating up. And floating by, and the plan of God just keeps coming up and keeps going by in your heart. When are you going to stop and follow through? Now, I would be remiss as a pastor, as a watchman for the flock if I didn't tell you this. Because this is true. And this isn't mean, this isn't harsh, this isn't hard, this is Bible. If you keep living your life, Letting that pass by you, letting that just float by and you don't ever want to follow through on it. Well, now, the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. You're putting yourself in a position where it's going to bottleneck God's provision and grace in your life. Because you're saying no to his plan. He loves you. He loves you dearly. Doesn't change his relationship to you as your father if you're born again. Doesn't change his relationship to you as a loving father who loves you. But you're straining the relationship when it comes to fellowship and when it comes to provision because you're saying no. You're saying no to him. You're saying, no, you don't want to do that. You're saying, no, I don't want to go back and do that. I don't want to, I don't want to return to do that. It could be something even as simple as asking forgiveness from somebody you wronged or something that happened. I don't want to do that. Well, you don't want to live that way. You don't want to live in a place. It's, it's wilderness. It's, it's cut off from provision. It's cut off from the blessing. It's cut off from the greater works of God. It's cut off from his best for your life. And it's living in a strained place, right? So that you can't, you can't really do or be what God has really called you to do and be, right? And so many people are praying from that place. So many people are trying to make a life. I, I say it this way. A lot of people have tried to rebrand Kadesh as Canaan, right? When the children of Israel are on the way to, to, to Canaan, to the land of promise, and they get into Kadesh, and uh, they don't want to go into the land because they're giants in that land. So they're just like, you know, they get all mad at Moses and everything. And so much of the time, that's how we are. It really is a type and shadow for us that we don't want to enter fully into God's plan for our lives. So we kind of stay outside on the outskirts of his plan. And we stay there and we just kind of, we try to rebrand it. This is my promise. And we keep trying to get God to bring all the grapes to Kadesh. No, the grapes grow in Canaan. The grapes grow in Canaan. So you got to go there. He's not, he's not going to bring the grapes to Kadesh. <laughs> He's not going to plant them in Kadesh and grow them there. No, you got to go where they grow. So the blessing, the provision is in the plan. You've got to go into the plan, child of God. You have to follow through on what you hear. Amen. You got to do it. Now, one of the things that I found is that when we don't live this life, when we don't live this way and we don't choose to follow God's plan, we choose to live by ambition, we get caught up in the rat race, right? We get caught up in the rat race of life. We get caught up in trying to compare and compete and to, to, to do all of the things that we think uh, provide for or uh, symbolize success, right? And so we end up overextending ourselves and doing all kinds of things. But can I tell you, when you hear God's plan, and you do his plan, here's the third thing, do only his plan. And that's just as important as doing it. Do only what you hear from him. Don't do what you see other people doing. Don't do what you think looks like is succeeding. Don't follow paradigms. Don't follow... Uh, the new fad, don't follow what you think will get you this, that, or the other. Only what he tells you to do. That's what you do. That's what you spend your money on. That's what you pursue. That's what you choose to have relationship with. You only do what he tells you to do. That's a verse of scripture I want to bring to your attention that I think is, uh, man, 
This is, this is important. It's in Psalms 32 and 8. And in your own time, I want you to go back and I want you to read this. Meditate on it. Psalms 32, 8 says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go, the way you should go. So the Lord's instruction is always going to be consistent with the way you should go. Not the way you want to go, not the way you'd like to go, not the way you feel like going. It's his instructions, his word to you is going to always be based upon where you should be going. <laughs> Amen? Because he has a will and a purpose for your life. So he instructs you in the way that you should go. Listen at this. I will guide you with mine eye. I will guide you with my eye. God says, I'm going to guide you based on what I see. I'm going to guide you with my eye. So he's not going to guide you based on what you see. And this is important because this is why I say do only what he tells you to do. Because how many of you can agree, I'm sure it should be consensus, it should be all of you. God can see further than you. God can see more than you. God can see deeper than you. God can see through things that you can only look at. <laughs> you, you're looking at the situation. God is looking through the situation. He sees the other side of scenarios. He sees the other side of relationships. He sees the other side of a choice and a decision. And he says, I'm going to guide you with my eye. If you listen to me, now this gets uncomfortable to the flesh. And here's why. Because if God is going to guide you with his eye, he will instruct you to do things that don't line up with what you're seeing with your eyes. You see, you're seeing something with your eyes and you're going, Lord, you want me to do that? I can't do that. I don't, because you're looking, you're trying to live by your eyes. But he said, no, 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 I'm not going to consult your eyes to guide you. I'm going to guide you by mine. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to guide you by my, I almost took off running off this set, but that wouldn't have benefited you none. <laughs> I'm going to guide you with my eye. I am going to look down the road. I am going to look at all that is in front of you, and I'm going to do, do the guiding by what I see, and I need you to just be a follower. And that's why I said doing only what he tells you to do. Because, child of God, if you neglect following what he sees and you go off of what you see, you're going to be subjected to all of your blind spots. He ain't got none. He has none. He doesn't miss anything. He, the, he, he ain't missing anything that hadn't even happened yet. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know what's going on in 2023 on April, the, what is it, 28th? 28th. You, you know what's going on now. You might have a little insight as to what's going to happen next week because you got a schedule. You might have a little insight as to what's going to happen next month because you're planning for something. You might have a little bit, but ultimately you don't have much. And you only have fragments and pieces because we see through a glass darkly. So now you take your little dark vision <laughs> where you've got all these little fragments and you're going to try to piece together a life out of that when God is offering you a life guided by his panoramic full and complete vision. Mm -mm. I think I'm going to live by what he sees. I'm going to let him guide me with his eye. I'm pastoring now because I'm following based on what he sees. Hallelujah. There are things we're doing now in ministry because I'm following what he sees. Some things may feel out of time. Some things may feel uncomfortable to the flesh. Some choices and decisions may, may feel like, man, I can't do that. For somebody, I, I just I feel like I'm getting this in my spirit right now. For somebody who knows that the, the impression of the spirit is for you to make a choice that looks like you're going to lose He's, he's calling you to back out of something. But you're like, man, 
I can't back out of that. I can't, I can't, I can't. That's, that's not, that's, it's, it, he's guiding you with his eye. He's not guiding you by what you see. It looks like it's how it looks like it's going to benefit you through your eyes. He is guiding you with his. You are looking at the scenario. He is looking through the scenario. Hear his voice and then do it and do only what he tells you to do. Praise God. Amen. So he wants to lead me with his eye. Now, why is this important? This is my last point, and I'm going to close it up. I have to learn how to do what he tells me to do and only do what he tells me to do. Because when I stand before God, I am not going to be rewarded based upon what I did. I'm going to be rewarded based upon how I obeyed what he told me to do. When you come before God, let's just say this is your life. This represents your life, right? And you come before the Lord, and we stand before him because all of us are going to, every single one of us. The Bible tells us we're going to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether they be good or bad. The Bible tells us that he's going to come and judge the quick and the dead. The Bible tells me that I have a date before the judgment seat of my Lord and Savior. But what is that date going to consist of? It's going to consist of whether I did what he told me to do. It's not going to be based on what I did by myself, on my own. Because sometimes we prize ourselves. We, 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 we praise ourselves. Oh, oh, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. As if we're going to get before Jesus and we're going to offer to him all that we did. But if what you offer is not what he asks of you, it's not an offering. If the talents teach us anything, the, 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 the teaching on the talents where the, the, the master goes a far distance and he divides his talents to his, his servants, gives one five, gives one two, gives one one, you know the story. They go out, five trades, gets five more and has ten, two trades, gets two more and has four. The guy with one goes and buries it, puts it in the ground, <laughs> and it's like, hey, ain't doing nothing. He's lazy. He has a negative perspective of his, of his master. He's not trying to be beneficial or fruitful in any way, shape, or form. And when the master comes back, he rewards the guy with 10, he rewards the guy with 4, and he cast out the one who buried his talent. Now, if that teaches us anything, it teaches us a lot of things, but one of the things it teaches us very preeminently that we need to see is that those men brought back to the master what the master gave them. What you do with God's plan for your life is what you're going to present to the Lord Jesus Christ. What he has asked of you is what you're going to bring. If he told you to build a church in Timbuktu, if there's a church in Timbuktu that you, were, that you built, then that is what you're going to bring to him. And he's going to say, well done. Well done, because that's what I ask of you, and that's what you went and did. If he asks you to start a business and to do this or to serve in this capacity or to serve in that capacity, and you did that, that's what you're going to bring to him, and he's going to say, well done, well done. You're not going to bring what you wanted to do. Sorry. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You're not going to reach back there and say, but, 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 but you don't understand. See, but, I mean, they loved me. The, the people loved me. You, you, they loved me when I did this. They, 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 you, you see how rich I got doing this? But that ain't what I asked you to do. That's not what I had planned for your life. You see, how, you see how weighty this is. So we have to become people who sit and establish in our hearts nothing is more important than the will of God. Nothing. Nothing. And I'm at this stage and phase in my life where I'm telling you, there is nothing more preeminent on my priority list than God's will for my life. I don't need fame. I don't need fortune. I don't need, and, I, and, and the beautiful thing about it is when you do the plan of God, you're blessed. So you don't want for anything. He just, he just increases you. He does it here a little, there a little, step by step. 
and he takes you up and up and up, you won't want for anything. It's not like you're vowing poverty when you, <laughs> when you commit to the plan of God for your life. He's going to lead you in a way that is as the shining light that grows brighter and brighter. That speaks of increase, child of God. That doesn't speak of decrease. That doesn't speak of poverty and impoverishment. But what it does speak of is something that's hard on this flesh. It does speak of death to self. And sometimes we don't like that. But be encouraged that if I, if I submit to the plan of God, oh, man, oh, man, my life is going to take on fulfillment. It's going to take on meaning. You know, outside of the purpose of God, can I tell you something? Can I give you a little hint? Uh, let you know on a, on, a, on a revelation. Outside of God's plan for your life, the highest you can achieve in this life is enjoyment. But you can't achieve fulfillment. Outside of the plan of God for your life, you can experience enjoyment. But you will never experience fulfillment. And we have a culture that is conflated the two. They think enjoyment is fulfillment. But it's not. And that's why so many people have testified of the same. I mean, how many testimonies have you heard where people say, man, I was doing this, I was doing that, but man, I was so empty inside. I just, it wasn't enough. And I just had to keep doing this and keep doing this and doing it over and over and over. When you read the book of Ecclesiastes, that's what Ecclesiastes is trying to tell us. It's vanity of vanity. Everything under the sun is vanity until you, until you fear God, keep his commandments and walk in his plan. <laughs> Everything is going to be rinse and repeat vanity. <laughs> vanity on rinse and repeat. And there will never be anything but momentary enjoyments, but there'll never be fulfillment that only comes from God. That only comes from his will being performed in your life. So child of God, I wanted to encourage you with this because I feel like given the times that we're living in, it is very easy to get pulled off the beaten path of God's plan. It's very easy to find yourself drifting into all kinds of extracurricular activity uh, and that, that's not God's plan for your life, that it isn't what he's leading you to do. And, and we're full of ambition, we're full of drive, we're full of get up and go, we're full of being, we're go-getters, we're grinders, we're hustlers, we're all of these different things, and I'm okay with a great work ethic. I believe in that. But I believe in having a great work ethic that is employed in the plan of God I've heard from him. Because outside of that, it's vanity. Outside of that, it's frustration. Outside of that, it's just you chasing your tail until you are gone. And God doesn't want that for you. God doesn't want that life for you. He wants you to live in a path. The path of the righteous is as a shining light. That grows brighter and brighter. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Those are inclined steps. Those are advanced steps. Amen. He wants to guide you with his eye. But you have to do the humbling yourself and listening. And then following through. And then only following through with what he tells you to do. That's the good life, y'all. I'm telling you. Take it from me. I'm trying to be a witness to you today. That's the good life. God is good, and I pray that you have gotten something out of this today. And if you have, share it with somebody. Give this to somebody. Because whether or not they, they may seem like they will accept it or not, this is something that needs to be heard by everybody, both saint and sinner alike. The hour is far spent. The day is at hand. The hour in which we live, and it's only going to get worse. The world is going to grow darker. It's not going to get brighter. That's not what the Bible promises us or tells us. The world is going to get darker. So it behooves us to really hone in and zero in with laser focus on God's plan for our life. And if we do, man, it's going to be all good. You have nothing to fear and nothing to worry about. God bless you guys. I love you. Thank you for tuning in. CNC family, share this with your family, your friends. Spread the word of God about this podcast. And we will see you next Friday right here, same time on the One Word Podcast.